Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my work. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. The future of work is now. It's not part of some distant future. Through our gender equity initiative, we have been thinking about the ways in which the future of work is changing and women's position within this change. The rise of AI and automation mean that some jobs will be lost, some jobs will be gained, and many will need to reskill. The higher education sector is not immune from these experiences, with generative AI posing serious challenges and opportunities for all of us. For those of us lucky enough to work in higher education, we can often be at the forefront of knowledge while simultaneously working in institutions that can be more medieval than modern and resistant to change. My fear is that this resistance will make us combative to major advances in AI when in fact we should be embracing them as tools to help us do new and innovative things. Now I'm just gonna see how I'm going. Everyone happy? Okay, cool. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, some good news. Let me tell you the good news for the sector. Here is a, sh a slide showing the AI exposure potential for education as a broad industry. Can you see my, sorry, I can't see you, but can you see my cursor or not? Can you, sorry, can you give me a no, thumbs up if you so. can see it? No, I'm hearing no. Okay, if you look across, this is AI exposure across all of the industries. And if you go one, two, three, four, fifth in, that's where education sits, right? So thinking about AI exposure. Um, here's a slide showing you the AI exposure for education as a broad industry. You can see that education has some of the lowest potential for AI exposure compared to other industries. What it means is that it's unlikely that huge segments will be replaced by AI. The reason is, as I will show you in a bit, we in higher education hold and train many of the skills that will be difficult to replace with AI and are incredibly critical for the future of work. What is more, someone is gonna need to train, well, everyone for the incredible skill shift that's coming. And so educators in higher education specifically are gonna be key to that future. As the next shot slide shows, Thank you. Um, if you come across again, here's uh, the first one is administrative service. This is the automation potentials. So think about AI and automation is two different experiences, right? AI is artificial replacement. Automation is this replacement of the skills, kind of routine automatable skills. So where is AI replacement is low in education? If we come across here, one, two, three, and four again in green, we see that education has some risk for automation. So AI is, is low and automation is reasonable. I promise I'll get to the mental load. This is all going to happen. Don't panic. Um, as this shows you, the education industry also has a relatively moderate risk for automation. Think about the routine tasks we may do as educators, like grading essays or math problems. Grading knowledge acquisition, whether students have the right or wrong answer, could be automated. Our automation risk is relatively low because a lot of what we do is routine and requires a human to think, it, sorry, is not routine and requires a human to think about next steps. We are adaptive, we are creative, and we are constantly scanning the world for the, for the new. These are difficult skills for AI and automation to replace. And again, these skills are critical for the future of work. A lot of these predictions, however, were produced before the release of generative AI. These are systems like ChatGPT. This is a real game changer for our industry. And what it means is the specific aspects of higher education will be replaced by generative AI. For those of you who don't know, generative AI are things like ChatGPT, it can write these incredible essays, it can co uh, collate information, and it also is this kind of income generators that, you know, you may have seen one of these in news where they take like images, AI is predicting images of what people might look like from different suburbs. So if you haven't seen it, take a little Google and see if you agree with how AI is capturing our world. It's these kind of generative systems. Um, the next slide will show you, 
What we can see is that generative AI, so I'll just walk you through this because I know sometimes when people throw up a lot of graphs, it can be a panicked moment. Um, if you look at the top, that's educator and workforce training. That's the first one. If you go down, so I know you can't see my slide, but my cursor, but educator and workforce training is number one. As you go down the list, you can see business and legal, um, business and legal professions, STEM professions, community services, creative arts and management, office support managers, et cetera, et cetera. We're sitting at that top, educator and workforce training, and we're also in this office support manager uh, and some of the other production work components within. If you go to the right, what it's showing you is within these occupations, and I'll talk to you about this in the next, but within the occupations, that blue bar, that light blue bar is the, the percent of jobs within the occupation that could be replaced by generative AI. So thinking about your job, thinking about within it, what is gonna be replaced? So you can see there's high risk of replacement with generative AI for workforce training, for office support, for managerial work. This stuff is going to take pieces of our work. So I'll come back to my scripted slide. Um, generative AI has the potential to have a big impact on how we in higher education do our work. It is predicted to replace 54% of educator and workforce training, 57% of STEM tasks, 53% of creative and art management work, and 87% of office work and 44% of management work. As academics and workers in higher education, we are often asked to wear many hats, to be both a researcher, a lecturer, a website developer, a podcast creator, a form filler outer, a letter writer, a therapist, and so on. Generative AI has a potential to do some of this work for us, to provide the support system that perhaps we always wanted, but never had. And if we were smart, we will be able to leverage this to create more capacity, more time, and more innovation. I would be remiss to say, to not say that yes, some jobs will disappear. But for many of us in higher education, the jobs will remain, but their composition will change. And this will require us to respond to that change. Um, next slide, please. If we look at this, this is the, the job growth, largest job growth that's coming, predicted growth in five years in terms of millions of jobs. If you go down the left column, we are probably not gonna be agricultural equipment operators. We are probably not gonna be heavy truck and bus drivers, but we are potentially vocational education teachers. We are in business development. And if you keep going down, you can see university and higher education teachers are predicted to grow. So it is these tremendous changes for everyone that will mean that jobs in higher education are predicted to grow. It is expected that over 2 million jobs in vocational training will be created and over 1.5 million jobs in higher education will also be created. Why? Well, higher education and education training will be essential to filling this transition into new ways of working. Someone will need to train everyone, not just young people, but everyone in key future work skills. You are currently living through the fourth industrial revolution, and it means there has been and will continue to be big change. And for a critical period of time, we will have this mismatch in the skills of the workforce and the skills of new ways of working. Higher education will be critical to filling this void. And if we can understand what is coming for us and get our approach right, we will be the leaders in this field. Now, I know what you're thinking. Can't a robot just replace me in my role and teach people these basic skills? Well, the answer is not quite yet. I mean, maybe eventually, but not yet. Future workers will require a diversity of skills that are difficult for a robot or AI system to fully replace. Yes, you will need some basic digital literacy um, and a deep understanding of what AI is doing and how it impacts your work. 
but a lot of the skills required for the future of work are those that humans continue to have the edge and that higher education specifically is excellent at imparting. This slide shows you that the World Economic Forum in their 2023 report identifies the top 10 future work skills. One, analytical thinking. Two, creative thinking. Three, resilience, flexibility, and agility. Four, motivation and self-awareness. Five, curiosity and lifelong learning. Six, technological literacy. Seven, dependability and attention to detail. Eight, empathy and active listening, nine, leadership and social influence, and 10, quality control. Many of these skills are the types of skills that we impart through higher education. This is what we do well. And these are the types of skills that we often model ourselves within this field. We are in a unique position to be the innovators, the creators, and the educators in this new world of work. But this is going to require us to create a space where we can try, fail, and innovate. It also requires convening diverse groups of people to discuss big and important issues, sketch new ways forward, and build technological systems that are as innovative as they are inclusive. The university is designed to do this work, and if we are smart, we will create support, create, support, and expand spaces for failure and innovation. We are the future of work, but only if we are able to understand our position, work with advances in AI, and create opportunities for our students, staff, and faculty to grow into the future of work. Now, I bet you thought I was done, but I'm not. Um, here, I'm telling you a hopeful story, but here's where I see the challenges. Here is where there is a problem. Our research on the mental load is showing that many in higher education are carrying intense mental loads that are leading to burnout. The pandemic created an incredible challenge and with it, an intense mental load. And while many in Australia didn't quit their jobs. Our research coming through our Work Futures Hallmark is showing that Australia is the country of the great burnout. Let me tell you what the mental load is because it is more than just the organizational work of the home. In an article written by myself, Brendan Churchill and Liz Dean at the University of Melbourne, we identify the mental load as having two components. The first is that it's cognitive labor. This is the work we do in our brains. The second is that it is emotional labor. This is the work we feel in our hearts, our bodies, and our souls. If the mental load was as simple as keeping track of activities, managing calendars, and tracking whether work emails have been responded to, it wouldn't be so draining. Rather, the mental load is a load because it is this combination of emotional and cognitive labor. It is the work we do when we think about whether our parents are okay in aged care, whether our child is being bullied at school, whether our bosses are satisfied with our work, or whether our students are emotionally well. This work is inherently mental and emotional, which is what makes it heavy. As the next slide will show, we carry this mental load across a range of domains. We don't just do this mental load for ourselves. We do this mental load in our workplace when we set work targets, um, next steps, health and well-being, and productivity of colleagues. We do this for ourselves when we're starting to think about health, illness, safety, um, whether we're doing uh, enough to do self-care. We do this work at home when we do housework or the maintenance of bills when we keep track of that. We do this work for our families when we care for loved ones. We do this work for our community when we think about friendships, extended family, um, changing politics, environment, health, economics. These are all individual mental loads and we're carrying all of them simultaneously. What we know from the next slide is that from our research is that the mental load, I'm sorry, yeah, perfect. The mental load sits across these five kind of components. So we carry these mental loads across domains. And then when we do it, we do it in this cyclical uh, uh, process. 
This work we do through continuous cycles of remembering what needs to be done, strategizing how to do it, coordinating who should do it, executing the work to be done, and monitoring whether the work is done right. And across all of this work is a constant surveillance, what many in our interviews and focus groups described as an almost sixth sense about people's moods, emotions, experiences, and the success of that mental load work, whether we were doing it right. We heard stories about people monitoring their children's shrugged shoulders, their partner's down days, and their parents' bodies for signs of decline. They also talked about monitoring their team's subtle facial expressions on Zoom. They were looking for signs that things were or weren't going okay, of small signals that could potentially show up as big future problems. The mental load is work we do day in and day out. We all hold a mental load, but the composition looks different for different people. And for some of us, it's heavier at certain moments in time. It ebbs and flows, it stacks and lightens. So how did these two concepts connect? I'm talking to you about the mental load and the future of work. Well, I just told you that we are facing a revolutionary change that is going to require a reskilling and re-educating of much of the workforce. And I just told you that higher education is going to be central in this role of reskilling others. I also told you that you are going to need, need to reskill, that we are going to need to reskill ourselves. And then I told you that many of us have barely enough mental load capacity to keep our current lives running, let alone to learn create and innovate using new technologies. I have been in interviews where mothers share that they barely have enough energy to even make it into the shower at the end of the day. And yet we are about to ask them to become experts in AI, automation, and generative AI so we can all incorporate these new technologies into our research, into our classrooms, into our work, workplaces, and into our lives. We need to ensure that all of us are preparing the current workforce and next generation for these future of work challenges and imparting new future of work skills. This is our purpose. We will need to do this work, but we will also need a workforce that has bandwidth to be both the student and the teacher and many of us are currently running on empty. Key and critical to work, sorry, key and critical to the work we are doing through our gender equity initiative is to make sure that the future of work is equitable and that includes the future of tech. We cannot live in a world in which only certain groups have the time, capacity, and mental load energy to keep up to date with advances in and contribute to the innovations in technology. And others are too overloaded by their mental loads and time demands to participate. This is neither fair nor effective. We will need everyone working towards an equitable future. And that means everyone. So where do we go from here? I have three action points for you working in higher education to take back into your discussions and take back into your workplaces. Are you ready? Action point one, we need to reduce the fear about AI and the rise of machines. And we need a workforce that understands the opportunities, challenges, and unknowns these new technologies will bring. Our research is showing that complementarity is key giving people a deep, deeper understanding of hard skills or tech skills, while also underscoring the equal value of human skills is essential to remaining competitive into the future of work. Our gender equity team has put together a series of micro certificates 
on AI and the future of work with a specific focus on women. Our goal is to give our learners a basic understanding of AI and automation and to provide an overview of which industries, which occupations, and which skills are going to grow into the future. We are committed to inclusivity in the future of work. Driven by this value, we've also taken this training to year nine young women at secondary schools that are historically marginalized from higher education. Inclusivity is key to the future of work and technology, and we need women in this conversation. But first, we need, people need to reduce fear about and increase a sense of belonging to technology and its advances. AI and automation are going to impact us all, and you do not need to be a computer scientist or an engineer to be a part of that conversation. We need everyone to be a part of that conversation. And that starts with demystifying tech and future work trends, and to break down the false narrative of being either a computer person or a people person. The future of work is not an either or, it's the future of and. So we need to embrace the and and drop the or. Action point two, organizations need to commit reducing the mental load of its workforce. The mental load of many of us is overloaded, which contributes to exhaustion, fatigue, and burnout. Caregivers, people of color, migrants, and indigenous peoples carry distinct mental loads that require distinct resources for their alleviation. We cannot assume that the mental load is experienced equivalently for all of us. And so resources need to be tailored to the unique mental loads and constraints of our workforce. We are currently doing this work actively, both from a research perspective, but also from an organizational perspective to help workplaces understand, one, what is the mental load? Two, how do your employees carry it? And three, how can organizations develop an equity, not an equality lens to support their employees' unique mental loads? Future work is going to impose tremendous challenges that will require us to be at our best. And this means supporting the mental load will be critical so people have the bandwidth to respond to these challenges. This is important for those in higher education. We're gonna be at the forefront of retraining and reskilling. And so reducing heavy, draining, and ineffective mental loads to create space and energy for people to work towards bigger, bolder, and more innovative dreams, ambitions, research, training, education, and more is critical. The future challenges are going to be big challenges, and we need everyone to be a part of the solution. This means reducing workloads to increase capacity. Action point three checking to see if I'm talking too much or I'm right on schedule. I hope you're happy. Um, my last action point, action point three, final action point. Universities, like all other organizations across industries, will need to invest in upskilling their workforce. This includes ensuring that their workforce understands key trends in the future of work and has the human and technical skills to thrive. We just convened a panel of experts on AI, ChatGPT, and the future work. The key messages from this expert panel were threefold. One, the technological changes we are experiencing are an opportunity and organizations must rise to this challenge. Two, humans have long adapted to technological change and these advances are just a continuation of this pattern. And three, we all will need time to try, test, and learn about these new tools. This last point is critical for the higher education sector. We often think of ourselves as experts, and we are, but we are also learners, and we will need to retrain in new technologies. This will require us to be humble, and to prepare to be bad at it at first. We will need to fail to grow. From an organizational perspective, we will need time and space to learn something new and to try new ways to integrate new technology into work, 
research classrooms and lives. This will require us to dismantle some of the focus on constant productivity. Learning something new means time. But if we continue to focus on KPIs, publication points, number of grants supported, and other targets that don't include space and time to trial, test, and fail, then we will be left behind. In conclusion, as we engage in these discussions today, and you carry them back to your universities, I ask that we think about this as a moment of opportunity. We saw how quickly the world can change during the pandemic and how quickly we can adapt to new ways of being, thinking, and working. The future will continue to be a continuation of this trend. Major challenges, major changes that will require us to be at our best and to respond. We can rise to these challenges if we ensure everyone has adequate mental load capacity to do new things and universities and the higher education sector commits to supporting their employees' mental load, investing in their reskilling and future work skills, and incentivizing time to learn new things. Ultimately, this will allow us to step into a future of more. Um, we're here, we're doing this work. We have four years where we're working on the mental load. We're doing a lot of future work, kind of training, reskilling, rethinking. Um, so we're here to engage in these conversations. We exist and we'd love to hear from you if you have insights, ideas, or new ways we can work together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Leah. That was um, <laughs> very thought-provoking and, I mean, exciting in some ways. Um, I don't want to say it's scary, but I think it's um, confronting, uh, perhaps. So um, we uh, have a little bit of time for questions. Does if anyone wants to put questions in the chat, we can I can relay them. The sentiment has gone through the audience. I'm sorry, inspired and nervous. I love this. Aren't we all <laughs> post pandemic? <laughs> Can I actually just respond to that kind of sentiment about, in particular for women, right? About this feeling of being both sure, inspired sure. and nervous. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is just kind of break this barrier about women feeling like they aren't included, right? Like that's our goal is to both say, hey, you are actually critical and essential for the future of work. You are actually bringing a lot of these skills that we're going to need and we need you to be present. And if we don't know what we don't know, we can't participate. So, so we want to knock the nerves out a little bit and say like, women are actually critical to the future of work. So how do we increase that visibility on that. So at least you're coming in with some of the base knowledge so you can be a part of the conversation. That's it, be present, know what's coming and prepare. Thanks, Leah. Um, there, is a, there is a comment that says, um, as a working parent, um, not often unencumbered enough to learn and develop as much as they'd like. Could you, could you make any comments about how you see that working for people? Working for um, women? Oh, okay. Um, I'm working for, I'm often uncovered enough to learn and develop much as I like. Okay, well now I'll tell you a little bit about our mental load work that we're doing. So some of the work we're doing around the mental load is how do we help women understand what is the mental load? Like it's kind of this invisible thing that we do that once you give it language and visibility, it helps to, to see all the different components we do of the mental load, the process, a lot of the working parents are saying, in particular, the mothers are saying, I do that process of remembering, strategizing, coordinating, executing, monitoring, and surveilling. I do that all the time. I do, a, I do that on constant cycle. And I do that both for a million contingency plans. So I'm doing this both in terms of what is going to happen and what hypothetically could happen. So my mental load is like stacked. 
what we're doing, I'm writing this book and it's like a real book that maybe you might want to buy at some point at an airport, not a typical academic book that maybe I only read. Um, and one of the things that I'm working on is this mental load audit. And it's this idea of how do we start to think about a mental load like a bank account? We all have mental load capacity, but some of us allocate it differently. And how do we understand where you're allocating your mental load so that you can be a little bit more strategic, both Thank you, Trisha. Both in terms of um, aligning it with your goals and aligning it with kind of the key people that you want to invest in. And so our goal is to kind of restructure, reorient that so that you then have more space, more capacity to, to reskill, to relearn, right? That it opens it up for you, that we're not draining our mental load in ways that are unproductive, but we're actually investing it. So that's the individual side. The organizational side though is saying within a workplace that this is a priority. So we can ask women to minimize their mental loads at home and at work and that's fine, but organizations also need to prioritize this and make it, give people time to do it. It shouldn't just be additive on the side because it's too important for the future. Um, and so this is why I just wanna stress that although we have this kind of individual audit that if you wanna participate, we're doing our research project on it, um, but in addition to that, it has to be kind of centered at the at the workplace. Otherwise, all we do is ask women to solve structural problems when they're already kind of maxed out, right? It just becomes additive work. So, so that's why I really am stressing organizations, universities need to give that time, KPIs, money, investment, et cetera. That additive, that concept of additive load is is really compelling. Um, we've, of course, we've got the question then on how do we get the men to help with their share of the of the mental load. Um, don't you worry, we're interviewing dads too, so we're um, we're hearing, we're getting an understanding of what's going on. Um, I want to give you like a little precursor of some of the research findings. Do you want to hear? We're very oh. early on. We're early on. Um, so one of the things I want, I'm, we're, the way we're pushing our understanding and someone asked like, how do you get organizations to understand it? We're doing these talks within organizations. So we can come and talk to organizations about this specifically. But what I want people to think about is you have a certain mental load capacity, right? It's not that men don't carry a mental load. It's that they have a mental load, but it's just going to different things. It's the allocation. So think about it like on balance. What we're hearing from our interviews is that a lot of men's mental load and father's mental loads is going to work. That where their energy, that remembering, anticipating, coordinating and executing is, it's like, think about your mental load like this and theirs is going more to work. And then the mothers are having like 25 different things and work. Um, so what we're also hearing from the men quite clearly is that they, they're they trying to figure out new ways of being dads. They're trying to figure out new ways of participating. They're trying to figure out new ways to engage. And they also don't have the language or conversation to understand what's happening. Um, and so our goal is to give you an, a better language and tool to come together and say, how does our mental load as a couple, as a partnership get allocated across these things? Are we working towards our goals? Um, can we understand that women's mental lo loads and women caregivers, uh, different mental loads have different balance? And where do we see equity in the balance? So thinking about the stacking, thinking about the division, thinking about an inability to concentrate because you have 15 million things ruminating, thinking about the mental load disrupting deep work and how do we stop some of that? And then, yeah, create a rebalance perhaps. Um, there's, there's a few other comments uh, in the question, the uh, comments. Um, I think I'll make this the final question because we need to allow time for the panel. But there is a question from Claire that says, um, have you seen organizations change to allow more time? Like, have, have you seen examples where this has actually been addressed at an organizational level? Claire, do you want to hear the good answer or the depressing answer? Um, no, uh, no, not yet. Uh, I think it's a new... Um, I think the change, when we tie to the future work, right? The future work's happening quickly and it's happening now. So I think there, uh, the challenge is that I think in the in higher education is often reactive rather than proactive. And so I think we're a little bit behind often. 
short answer is we're not seeing necessarily organization. Well, we see organizations to give people time and space to actually train in different stuff, leadership, right? I mean, so here's my short answer. Yes, of course. Organizations often invest in the human capital and development of their employees. Usually it's around leadership, capability, um, training. So why can't it be around, why can't we shift that narrative because it's more important and shift it around reducing mental load to increase capacity to retrain in future work skills. I won't keep going because I could talk to you about this forever. And I know the panel has amazing things to say, but yes, they have. And we need to make the urgency around this new thing. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Leah. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, I am very grateful that you are here today and it's really given us uh, thought for uh, some things to think through and I will certainly look out for your book and I might even find the academic paper and read that as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Nice to, nice to see you. Uh, I am handing over to Elka, who's going to introduce us to the panel. Thanks, Catherine. So I have the great honour of introducing our fantastic panel today. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce Professor Jared Ha. Jared is joining us from Auckland, New Zealand, and Jared is a professor of management and Māori business at Massey Business School, Massey University. Jared is a proud Māori man and has researched a range of topics, including Māori, burnout, well-being, and the four-day work week. Jared is an A-ranked researcher, which places him in the top 6% of business and economics researchers in New Zealand a fellow of the Royal Society of Te A Parangi, hope I've said that okay, but impressively a black belt in Kung Fu. So thank you, Jared. I'd like to next welcome Kim Copeland. So Kim is joining us from Sydney today and Kim is a trusted consultant operating Avion Consulting. She provides both clinical and non-clinical support in the areas of well-being, leadership, mental health, sexual mis misconduct conduct, and trauma-informed approaches across government, non-government, military, and higher education environments. Kim has also worked in higher education herself, having undertaken roles at both the University of Sydney and Charles Sturt University. Kim is also an ATEM member and facilitates some workshops for us, including a bit of a plug here, our Health in Mind, supporting mental health in the workplace, which is a workshop we have scheduled on the 10th of August. So check out the details on our website or in your ATEM newsletter. So welcome to Kim. And I'd like to welcome Professor Lisa jackson Fulva, who is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Indigenous Strategy and Services at the University of Sydney and is joining us from Sydney. Lisa is a proud Aboriginal woman whose experience extends beyond higher education into the Royal Australian Air Force and Australian Medical Council. Lisa has received extensive honours and recognition for her work in medicine and public health, including an Australian Military Service Medal for Service to Education, a Vice-Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence, not one but two Dean's Awards, and the Henry Stryker Community Honour for Outstanding Service and Contribution rendered with endeavours to make our society a better place to live. So thank you so much to our panel for contributing your time and knowledge to our conversation today. So we've got some questions to run through with our panel and then we'll open it to questions from the audience. So my first question is for Kim. Thinking about flexible hours, they've brought some balance or have they? With team members and colleagues working flexible hours, our own working hours become a bit of a blur. So how can we maintain boundaries for a healthy balance? It's a great question, Elka. And to answer that, let's 
first think about boundaries at work as our limits or our expectations or those personal roles that are rules that we put in place to keep ourselves from over committing or to protect our energy and help us to maintain a healthy work life balance, a really simplistic way of thinking about boundaries. And then let's think about what flexible work hours are, because they can vary in themselves from those varied start and finishing times to compressed working weeks to time in lieu, or maybe it's those short term plans where we need to manage a surge in our work or an emergency, or as leaders, we often use flexible hours as ways to keep up with workload and meet deadlines. So the first part of my response is that to maintain boundaries, we really should think about whether the flexible hours of our team and our colleagues are part of an agreement that requires us to adapt or whether it's by choice. And that can help us actually to set our boundaries because where those flexible working hours are existing in teams, they can have a flow on effect to managers and leaders and increase the need for us to be available. And I found that when your job's people related or are expected to respond to emergencies or crisis, there's often organisational processes in place for that. But there's been less attention to that impact of flexible work arrangements on managers and how that's crept into their need to be available over time. But you can manage this. And I think some of the ways to maintain that healthy balance is to identify the boundaries that you want to put in place and be really clear about them. So that might be about after hours contact, it might be about email response uh, expectations of times or after hours, uh, even how unplanned leave is notified. And if you think about the boundaries that you want to set, you can establish some really clear communication protocols and guidelines. You can talk them through with your team. You can set up automated systems using things like Outlook or have really established routines and more model that behaviour. You can think about the work that staff are doing at those different hours and make it more individual work than work that does require decision making or supervision or collaboration. But I think what's uh, really important is actually thinking about those work arrangements, whether they're your own or members of your team, and establishing them in writing, talking about the limits, establishing how you'd know if they're working or not, uh, how you're going to have contact outside of those normal working hours uh, and having reviews. And I think often they're forgotten in terms of going and looking, even if it's working well. You've also got to model your boundaries and walk the talk as such so that people see that it's okay, have plans in place for things like not working during planned and unplanned leave so that you can show that they're the times that you need to have those breaks and remind yourself that you do your best work when you look after your health and well-being and really give give that gift to your family of your full attention and your friends when you're not at work. I could talk for ages, but I know there's other questions for the panel. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kim. I think there's some really practical tools we can take away and apply there. My next question is for Jared. So the rate of change in the workplace over the last 10 to 20 years has been significant, as Leah mentioned. So if you think 20 years ago, smartphones were just being introduced. So you went to a meeting and then you came back to your desk to actually reply to emails, whereas now smart devices means we're contactable all the time and we're expected to keep up with emails during back-to-back -back meetings. And then adding that mental load of managing life, as Leah mentioned. So how do you think we can better manage these demands to avoid burnout, support our wellbeing and create space to develop those new skills that Leah was talking about? The order. Um, so I've done research on technology use and family time after hours, and you're looking at about four times the risk rate uh, of job burnout, of burning out, so the extreme level of burnout. So the evidence, at least from New Zealand data, is quite um you know, it's quite stark. And clearly the biggest problem is that the just the technology just endlessly taps us on the shoulder and I, and I ironically was talking to somebody yesterday and we were reminiscing about pre-technology days and I said something like you know I remember having to you know wait till I got home to get to the landline so I could call somebody and we were both kind of laughing about how romantic uh, those days were and 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 even that technology you're talking about, remember phones were this size, right? They were ginormous. If you could afford one and they weighed about five kgs or something. So there was nothing smart about them. So I think we, I think one of the things we have to do, and I did love um, 
Lisa's comment about looking after ourselves and realizing that the healthier we are, the 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 and family time and smart devices are there but as long as we are managing that load and saying actually maybe once a week two times a week is my limit right and maybe trying to make an agreement with if you have a significant other to say you know hey look let's have a couple of nights a week this week where we're just shutting down that technology um, you can use it to watch an online program together and family time because that's using the technology for entertainment, not for for work. I think it's just about and it comes back into Lisa's point about boundaries there, and but also realizing that that technology that makes it easier to break the ba the barrier or the boundary is really detrimental to our well being. It might be good for work, um, but you know, as I say to people, you know, if you burnt out, will your employer pay three months of your salary while you recover? And most people say, oh, no, not three months. And I go, well, there's, well, who are you working really hard for? Because, you know, you, that's the kind of cost you might pay. Kia ora. That's a really good way to look at it. It puts it in perspective. Um, Lisa, the higher ed sector is a place of progressive world leading research and education. Um, and to the point of um, Leah's third take home point, we need space to try, test and learn new tools. Mm -hmm. So what responsibility does our sector have in supporting the upskilling of its staff to meet future workforce and education demands? And how can the sector achieve commitment to upskilling whilst also caring for the well-being of our staff? So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm coming to you from Gadigal Lands in this place that's today known as Erskineville in Sydney. Um, and I pay respects to all of you who are here on this wonderful Zoom meeting, no matter whether you're from Adilaroa or from other places afar uh, or near. Thank you so much. Um, look, it's a huge, it's a really big question, and I'm really grateful that I've been able to ponder it for a few days. Um, but the reality is, is that we are the sector that trains the leaders to apply the technology and the learnings and the stuff into the modern day environment, right? Yet, at the same time, we are so reticent to take on our own knowledges in workplace psychology, our own knowledge is in technology, our own knowledge is in modern work practices or even law. You know, we don't make sense of the stuff that we're stuffing into our students to go out and share, right, and apply in their modern contexts. And so I find it quite remarkable that we are you know, saying that we're doing all this world leading research and education, but our adaptability is not something we've been able to fast track, you know, human beings, the human neurology, the human physiology does take time to adapt. And it's fascinating, despite how much knowledge we have and understanding that we have, we don't recognize that we as human beings working in a structure of our own creation have not been able to inbuild the opportunity to be able to decompress in a way. And as Kim was saying before, you know, it, it's really important, and, and Jared as well, saying before that it's really important that we take care of ourselves, uh, that we allow ourselves to be able to sit back and reflect and take time and take a breath, and to be able to, to recognise that we are not these autonomous, you know, we are not machines working in environment, but we are people working in environment. And the university or sector uh, or the government or, or whatever else is, is nothing without us humans, without us people, um, despite how clever we may be with the machines that are designed to assist us, ultimately we are nothing without each other. And so we're not taking much care of ourselves and we're not taking much care of each other. So I think it's really important that we as the leadership, you know, all of us collective we's, um, use our persuasion and our powers uh, to be able to engage with the opportunity of saying to people, part of your work has to be able to take time and reflect. And if that time and reflection is sitting on a riverbank fishing with your kids, then so be it. If that time to reflect is to be able to sit down and do a drawing uh, or a mind map 
or um, a creative task whilst you're thinking through some of the more interesting things that are happening at work, then so be it. This is healthy behaviours. We have lost the opportunity to engage with each other to be healthy in our work practice. And we know that relaxed and rested people come up with better ways of doing things. They come up with better inventions. They come up with better researchers. Research, um, they're better able to do their job. So I think it's really important that we recognise the influence that we can have on our sector and the influence we can have on Australia and the world as a whole by just being basically sensible and recognising we are biological and therefore we have biological needs. Simple as that. Great. Thank you, Lisa. One of the things we have in our office is a puzzle, and I particularly love it when I catch the dean having a go at the puzzle. Great role modelling, and it's thinking time. Um, so my next question is for both Jared and Lisa. So the conversation recently had an article that compared the cognitive load in same-gender couple relationships, households, versus heterosexual couples. And Leah in her presentation also mentioned that the composition of mental load looks different for each of us. So given your lived experience as Indigenous people, do you see a difference in, in the mental load for Indigenous peoples? Lisa? Oh, kia ora, kia ora, Lisa. Well, no, she's given me the signal. So, um, yeah. kia ora, Lisa. I will, I will answer that one. I've actually done research on this. Aronga Takirua is the Maori name for the double cultural shift. And what we found actually looking at academics and, um, and plenty of uh, wahini or, or women in our study is... Um, Academics often feel beyond their typical role, and we've we've talked about here about the you know the research and the teaching, the administration, the technology, the new training. They also had to act as as cultural navigators and explainers for their non-indigenous um, colleagues, and all of that work was just extra sandwiched in to uh, you know to help everybody else on the team at the expense of their own work. And we had scientists saying things like, oh, and I lose lab time because I just can't do everything. And so I do think those are, are a reality for uh, Indigenous um, academics. Um, I'm sure it'll be a similar thing. In, it's a, and it's one of those interesting kind of verses, right, as in, Indigenous or Aborigine um, culture gains more prominence, you're then starting to drag a very small number of Indigenous academics into multiple roles. And of course, they're just like, oh my gosh, I wish I could clone myself. But I believe that kind of science isn't quite here yet. Um, so it's, you know, and it's this kind of, you know, we found the cultural responsibility to do those roles is, is hard on Indigenous um, academics because they think if I don't do it, they'll send it to a non-Indigenous person. And then I think, oh my gosh, that guy will make a mess of it. Um, and so, yes, there is there is uh, evidence, at least from New Zealand. And uh, back to you there, Lisa. Kia ora. Yeah, kia ora. Um, look, all of that, you know, we, I mean, we, we have a variety of different sorts of roles um, in the Australian context, and some of them are Indigenous-identified roles where people who are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people have a genuine qualification to apply for that role. Um, and there is a very significant cultural load on that because when you put people into those sorts of roles, you are expecting that as part of the job on the whole, right? It's not always the case, but on the whole. So I'm speaking generalisations. Then you've got a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are working in institutions in roles across the sector uh, in every, every capability you can possibly imagine um, who are not in identified roles but still are expected to stand up, are still expected to know everything about everything that you could imagine, far beyond what any other human being is expected to, to know, um, and often have to end up being defenders of things, you know, unlike any other nation in the world where, you know, like, and, you know, we... we we recognise the absolute difficulty of that. You know, there was a time until fairly recently where the sole Aboriginal person in a group would be expected to do the acknowledgement of country or, or be wrongly asked to do a welcome to country or can you tell us some dream time stories, please, or can you, you know, help us understand what's going on and suddenly become a, a cultural competence or a cultural safety expert. And I find all of that to be uh, an incredibly difficult thing. And this is this is load that is not um, really recognised 
Um, you can't take your skin off at night and hang it up on the door when you leave the office. You know, you are Aboriginal or you're not. You know, you're a Maori or not. You're a Torres Strait Islander or not. You, you just don't peel that off when the business day ends. And sometimes it can be incredibly exhausting. And certainly in Australia at the moment with the debate about matters such as constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and some of the stuff that's happening there in the media, some of the commentary that's happening, um, you know, many of us are targets uh, of hate speech, um, myself included. There's a reason why I work at home a little more often than I used to do, um, uh, as is uh, the same for many um, in the sector who are, are talking um, about the voice, for example. Um, and it's not just about the voice, but it's about a whole swag of other things, including treaty and recognition and how we can get um, the, the truth of our history really embraced by Australians because we see how strongly our nation hurts and how much love we have for our nation and how much we want to move into the future embracing all parts uh, of who we are as a society. So all of this is a very heavy load. Um, and no matter what, um, what's happening in the environment at the moment does affect us all. Um, and most particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you know, along with the other responsibilities and concerns that we have in the community context. I'll finish off with one other little thing as well. It's only recently where Aboriginal people have been embraced by society. It's only recently where we've actually had graduates in university. Um, it's only recently, it's only just last week that our very first PhD in Australia, Aboriginal PhD in Australia, passed away. Um, and he received his PhD in the 90s, as in the 1990s, not the 1890s, Kia ora, um, you know, 18, uh, 1990s. Um, and since then, there's been lots and lots of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people going through university and going through the vocational sector. Um, but they're very recent times, right? They're decades. They're in my memory. In, you know, when I was a, a young girl, you know, there were lots of permissions that people had to have. We uh, were not part of the group. We were more assimilated into society than those who were living on missions or having to live in homes because they were part of the forced removals. But it's only recent times that Aboriginal people have been embraced in workplaces such as those that we have. Uh, it's in my generation that this has happened. And I think it hasn't been able to adapt suitably and rapidly enough to be able to take concerns and the needs of the emotional um, uh, kickback that always having to be the one that explains things. So you go home from work and you explain to your family what you do in the office because there's not the lived experience. Or if you're the first in family to go to university, you explain what campus life is about um, because, you know, there's no reference structure for that. You know, you explain to people how to use, you know, online systems, you know, like, and we can all relate to that because it's all fairly new and certainly within our lifetimes. Imagining do, imagine doing that about every part of your life. Imagine doing that, you know. So, and this is what we have with our young people today. You know, the responsibilities upon them all is really huge. And, you know, I don't know if there is a direct comparison with the level of cognitive load that that is on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, it, it's a biggie and I have not got the words to express it. So I look forward to some of you clever people publishing some more on this. It's a biggie. Perfect. Thank you both so much. Thank you for um, sharing so openly. It really helps illustrate the cognitive load differences that we all face and um, hopefully enables us to, you know, return to our workplaces with empathy for, for different people and different groups. Um, and one of the groups I'm mindful of working in the faculty of IT is also women who are, you know, in STEM and underrepresented. And so often there is a greater load on our women academics to be represented in panels and groups um, because we're keen to have that representation but it takes you know extra time from them to do um, their normal work. So that being said Kim question for you you work with a range of sectors what advice and good practices for managing burnout particularly for women can you recommend for us in higher ed that you've seen work well elsewhere? 
That's a great question. I think there's some really good examples out there and predominantly they're in organisations that are thinking organisationally rather than piecemeal approaches. And ironically, I usually refer people to look at Professor Ha's research on burnout to learn about it or to look at integrated approaches to mental health and prevention promotion response, uh, such as Professor Tony Lon La Montagne at, from Deakin and his colleagues. So really thinking broadly. But when I think about outside the sector, it's where there's leadership commitment and training and a commitment to helping people develop the competencies and confidence to do people management and not assuming it comes naturally. Uh, so helping people as they move through uh, each level or where organisations think about diversity, equity and inclusion quite holistically and not simply as focus groups, but ways of thinking and doing and being and really embedding that into their thinking right from developing policies or processes so that they're not retrofitting later to try to fix unintended consequences or where organisations are really committed to preventing sexual harassment discrimination. So they're looking at the behaviours that don't match values. They're addressing everything that's below the line and not waiting till things meet a threshold so that people not only know that it, this behaviour isn't okay, but that they can come forward if something's happened because we know women are disproportionately affected and that it can impact them in so many ways. I think as well, organisations that do whole brain thinking, so they don't jump to how we're we going to do this or tweak what we've always done. They look at what is the problem we're trying to solve and why, and who needs to be involved, who will be impacted, whose voice needs to be at the table, who needs to be part of the solution. And then they get to the how, because again, they're thinking about people that will be impacted or benefit from what they're doing. So I talk very organisationally because I think it's the best way to describe where I see it work best. And the other thing I'd throw in is where recruitment processes are really clear right from the beginning about what does a job involve, for example, what flexibility is or isn't available. If you've got a nine to five service delivery model then be open about what could be available and talk about it from the interview think about travel don't assume people can or can't travel so organizations that give time to allow for arrangements or even allow for childcare costs if they're incurred they're the organizations that are doing a great job to really help people manage the and balance all the things we've been talking about today and the list is massive but again i'll cut myself off there <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and so carrying on with that theme of best practice, I'm just curious from our, our panel generally, you all you know, work and have experience in our sector. How do you personally, um, what are your best practice tips for maintaining your own skills and knowledge? You're all in what I imagine will be quite you know, high pressure roles um, with lots, lots of things drawing at your attention. So do you have any tips for people here today about how you carve out the time to maintain your knowledge? I'm happy to jump in. I just spoke, but I think it's about finding time to do it and not thinking I'll find time later, put it in your calendar, put in regular reading time or attend professional development, use your networks, have conversations, but also I find using flights, so reading an article every time I get on a flight, and you can still do Netflix later or a podcast, you know, as you get in the car between meetings, you can still do your car karaoke. There's ways to sort of balance these things, but think about putting it up front and making it part of your routine so that you store things knowing next time I've, I'm on a flight or I'm doing these things, I'll do it. So really finding just ways to bring it into every day and not letting it slip in the busyness. I love that, Kim. That's my approach. Podcasts get into work mode on the drive to work and car karaoke on the way home to transition to home. So <laughs> fantastic. Lisa or Jared, did you have anything you'd like to add? Lisa? Thanks, Jared. <laughs> I think it's incredibly hard. You know, like the, the principle is, is that for every hour you work, there should be 10 minutes of decompression. You know, that's a lovely principle to operate on and I find it so incredibly hard to follow through. So um, I often promise myself um, that I will sit down and finish an article on a day when I know that my my meetings are back to back, you know, that even in Zoom rooms, you know, you don't get the dignity of being able to have a little bit of lunch um, or go to the Jilla one. Uh, yeah. And um, 
you know, so everything becomes really, really compressed. And by the time you get to the end of the day, you know, you, you really are not doing justice to those you love in your home life. Um, so I, I often um, do that whole Friday academic thing of doing emails, reading that article that I really need to read last week, finish off little bits of paper. I actually schedule it. You know, no meetings on this day. And it might be that I end up catching up on stuff, but at least I do my best so that by Friday night, I feel as though I've done something to enrich uh, myself in my job because that's really important, but to also um, do what I'm paid to do and that's complete tasks in a timely fashion and to do service, um, you know, to the university that I work for. So, you know, I, I try and balance that. But I'm also um, a learner outside of my job. Um, so um, I'll, I'll disclose that I, I live with a disability. I'm hard of hearing and going deaf. I wear hearing aids. So I'm learning Auslan. And the most interesting thing about learning um, a new language out of need uh, as an older adult learner um, is that you have to smash all those preconceptions of what it is to be an adult learner. I should know that because I'm an adult, right? Or I'm hard of hearing and I've always been like this and I've always lived free. So I should be able to do this sign language stuff really easily. But so you have to go through all this rubbish, right, inside your head. And the best thing about learning something outside of your usual skill, you know, your usual expertise is that it's surprising how much you can map becoming a learner again into your day-to-day -day job as you work with others, as you're transitioning them into a new way of being culturally at a university, right? So don't discard the higher uh, activities of your mind doing something and learning something which is outside of your usual expertise because it's just somehow the neurology is so magic it can map it onto other parts of your work life. And so I just thought I'd, I'd share that with you. I find that to be an incredibly uh, useful and surprising side effect of being an adult learner in a discipline outside of my own. Jared, did you have anything you'd yeah. like? Kia ora. I, I'm going to share. Well, thank you for that, Lisa, because I'll, I'll share a few of my things. I, I got three quick little ones, um, and they do kind of tie in quite a lot with Lisa there. One is I'm always looking to burgle time. I once worked with a colleague who said, I'm I'm teaching two papers a semester. I can't do any research. And I remember as a young academic thinking, man, there must be a lot of time you've spent getting. So so I will have a, if I have a meeting at five o'clock and we finish at 4.30, I won't say, oh gosh, I'll go and relax for half an hour. I'll go, oh, I got 20 of that 30 minutes to, to get a, you know, to, to get a coffee, do a little bit, bit of work on my paper. So I'm progressing stuff. So I burgle time to do the things I love, which happens to be in particular research. So there's one of my things. The second one, which ties into least, so I do martial arts. I, I go to Singapore every year for 23 years, except for Blim and COVID, which really brass me off um, and I always go there for about it's always the same it's like uh there on Saturday and we leave the following Sunday so it's and back Monday so it's always about eight or nine days there's nothing like telling people I'm away on leave and they say oh are you available oh, I'm training with my grandmaster oh and nobody wants to bother you right because then they just think oh she's really so I think if you say oh, I'm working on you know oh I'm taking a writing retreat oh great I'll send you stuff of mine that we can write on. No, no I want to do my thing. So I think it's about setting your own boundary. So that's my second one. And my third one is um, over time experience. I'm always learning. You know, I always say to my, especially my PhD students, if I'm in the zone, it's go, go, go. And when it's not, I, I never try to write, for example. I will, so I will have days where somebody goes, wow, how was your day? What'd you do? Yeah, I watched four episodes of Netflix. I finished, you know, people say, what are you talking about? I said, oh, nothing was flowing the last few days, right? And there's nothing like, and we've, and Kim and Lisa have kind of talked about that decompression. So, and and I just say it quite openly and, and without guilt, because when people say, oh, but this is a Wednesday, what are you doing watching Netflix? I said, no one was complaining when I finished the PhD on marking on a Sunday, right? You're all quite happy for that. And that always shuts people up basically um but i'm always I, i've spent times where you know i've spent a whole day on a laptop and i've written 
three sentences that were rubbish and I've just thought wow what a waste of time so now when I feel actually I, have, I feel no no zing towards uh research that's the time to go and do horrible admin that you that, that you just have to trudge through whether you're feeling good or not so those are my three little tips <laughs> that's what I use anyway kia ora no, fantastic. Thank you. I think there's a lot to be said for choosing the, the task, depending on what your mental capacity on that day is, and it does vary a lot. So thank you so much to the panel. I'd like to open now um, for questions um, that the audience might like to pose our panel, um, either verbally or through the chat, depending on what you're comfortable with. Isn't it fascinating that we're now getting all these hints on how to do Zoom meetings, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you know, secret squirreling the room. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in a meeting right now. So you just get that bit of space. It's really cool. Um, there's a question there um, from an organisational perspective. What about a no email day? Interesting concept. Yeah, we've done that a few times. At work in my portfolio, we we will regularly have um, a day where we do not contact each other. We, you know, unless it's an emergency, but where we can just focus and, and fixate, if you like, on doing those things that make us feel good, whether at work related things, um, you know, whether it's cleaning out your desk and your room and refreshing it and doing a spring clean or filing away those papers or emptying the emails or just, you know, doing other things like planning the rest of your time or doing your performance reviews. Mm. You know, we, we have that so that then there's no interruptions because that's the biggest thing. I'm not paid to answer emails. I'm not paid to fixate on that email box to see those things go ding, 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 ding as they come in. But that's all we do. And people almost get offended if you don't respond, as you know, we've heard earlier, you don't respond in a timely fashion. Well, I'd like to say, well, what is a timely fashion? In the old days, you'd pick up a phone and have a yarn to me. And if I wasn't available, I wouldn't answer the dreaded thing, right? So, you know, let's, let's work this through. So I'm all for it. And I think they're a really good idea. You just need to let the rest of the organisation know. <laughs> as I heard once, you know, your inbox is a list of other people's priorities. Um, meeting Louise's mentioned meeting free drag days, which is another great one. Um, so like Lisa, we try for meeting free Friday and that's a day to put your head down and get all your real work done between meetings. Um, Jared, were you going to add something? Yeah, yeah I, I really like the meeting freeze days as a, as a HROV researcher. I've done research on meetings and even though in all honesty, it's only a, a little tiny side piece, I always love bringing it up and telling people, oh, you know, you know, workers who have really fun and exciting and learn lots of meetings, they really like them. But if they're not that good, they hate them. And then people always get like, oh, Oh, and I'm like, so shorter meetings are best. And, and so I always like using the research as my own kryptonite to, to get this, the meeting super super people to have less of them um, because they really are, you know, as I find nothing worse than an hour meeting where I think I could have read that in an email in five minutes. Um, you know, why don't we go and have lunch and eat and socialize and, and share that information rather than waste meetings. So I'm I'm all about the no meetings. What about you, Kim? Absolutely. And I also like a meeting that at the beginning is really clear on the purpose and what the outcome is we're trying to achieve to keep us on track for that so that it doesn't become all talk and then we run out of time at the end to work out next steps or did we solve or get through what we needed to. So having that purpose. One of the, the comments in the chat is from um, Sarah at Griffiths University who um, said, I often think that we can be considerate of other people's mental loads. So thanks to Priya Parker, she's leading with the mantra of being a thoughtful gatherer, which includes generous exclusion, which I love. Um, it sort of ties into that quote to, you know, always be kind because everyone's going through a battle that you know nothing about. Um, I guess from our panel, are there ideas about how we, you, you know, might suggest that we are mindful of other people's, you know, mental load? Yeah, I get a bit worried about, I'll say that aloud, I get a bit worried about the promotion of are you okay sometimes? Because sometimes when you do say to someone, are you okay? 
Um, and I witnessed this um, where someone said, are you okay? Because there was obviously some distress in person. They said, no, I'm not, you know, and then listed these, you know, things that were happening that just made everyone's heart feel. And then I said, okay, so how can we help you? Um, and I, I, I've always carried the phone numbers of various services in my phone, but the person who asked, you know, do you need help? Are you okay? Didn't have those kinds of resources to hand. So I think that's one of the biggest thing is to ask people if they're okay, but to also have a sense that if they were to say no, that A, you're open to the conversation without having to suddenly go in and solve all their problems and B, have some resources to hand so that you know that, you know, if there is a need for a little bit more than what you're able to offer, you know, over a cup of tea and a bicky, um, that that's there. I think that's a really big deal. Um, often a compassionate ear is, is enough, um, but sometimes it's not. Yeah. I think you make a great point, Lisa. And when people are learning those skills about recognising, responding and referring, it's important, firstly, that we offer it to people and recognise everyone does it. And there's more to say after, are you okay? I think that was their theme one year. But also what to do if you're not sure. How to actually say to someone, before you go any further, I feel like this is a bit outside my my area too let's find someone who might be able to help or to be prepared for those conversations so I think they're really important skills that often get lost in things mm. fantastic yeah I am and just joining in on that one I, I think the power of having a you know a coffee or a tea with a colleague um, you know, loneliness is kind of one of those big things that's reared its head since um, COVID. And, and surprise, surprise, these uh, online um, meetings or gatherings are useful, right? Because although I wouldn't have minded coming to Australia, no, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, but um, we're going to Boston tomorrow, so I, I, I can't. Yeah. I can't be in two places, but, you know, they're, they're not as good as um, being opposite somebody, sharing a, a drink, a, a, a coffee or a tea or a cold juice or whatever, and maybe the conversation gets way complicated than you thought. And, Kim, you know, what you said there is a great thing, but if you said that at, at the end of an half, a half an hour cup of coffee, right, it is nice to say, wow, you've got a lot going on, and I have to be honest, it's beyond my my expertise, um, but you'll probably find that person and got a lot out of just you know talking to you as opposed to like oh can I send you an email mm, you know so impersonal so I think just reminding us all to to not be afraid to touch base um <laughs> yeah yeah Lisa you do that and you and my children are just like I do not understand have you got a you got a receiver in your thumb have you and I go no but that was on a movie once decades ago um so I do think just being able to to spend time with people. I mean, and again, a half an hour is right. I'm, I always like having research meetings over lunch um, where we actually discuss very little of the research, but because it helps build that relationship to keep things going when sometimes we can just kind of forget that we're, we're on the same team and months go by. We've got two great questions in the chat, but on account of time, I'm actually going to roll them into one. Um, so I've got a question from Lydia, which is around sort of the ability to manage your own time, say no to meetings that you don't think you need to be at. Um, and also a question from Charlotte about um, whether we think the um, stigma um, is reducing for staff who experience burnout. So the way I sort of roll that together is, you know, is there a stigma? How do we encourage um, behaviours in the workplace that allow us to opt out of things, depending on what our cognitive load is or, or our time allows? Do you have any sort of thoughts or suggestions there? So one of the things that I've found is that people are, are starting to use labels um, to refer to folks, you know, and we, we all know the story, you know, what passive aggressive, covert hostile, or, um, you know, there's a variety of other terms, narcissistic, and, and people are using these terms often in fairly casual conversations. And when you unpack that, these are really serious terms that require a considerable amount of training to be able to apply them to another human being. Uh, and a lot of thoughtfulness when you are applying it to another human being, because these can be incredibly hurtful, if not wrong. And cause considerable uh, harm 
to people's reputations, even if it's within a small workplace and, and people are doing it in a joshing kind of way. I've seen that quite a lot lately. And there's a stigma that is attached to the word burnout in the same way. And we, I, I, I can't imagine anyone who doesn't feel from time to time exhausted and burnt out. But when you're talking about someone who is suffering from burnout, that is a, a very different sequelae of events and a very, very different requirement for getting support to someone. So one of the things that I'd, I'd ask people to do is to think carefully about the terms that you're using and recognise that there's often a clinical imperative associated with those terms. And I don't want to have expressions such as burnout, uh, and I'm not saying minimised, but changed uh, away from, from the requirement of how one would help an individual or clinically treat an individual um, if they are suffering burnout versus someone who's really buggered after a really huge long week and just needs to decompress and get in the garden or go for a run, or do these other things. Um, you know, they've had a big day. Um, is that the right term? That's, I just wanted to be really you know, clear on, on what we're doing here. And you're right, um, it's, it's people often use these terms as a, a badge of honour. But again, you know, it's the onus is on us as, as people to help support those in our extended families, which are our work families and our communities, which are our work communities, um, to be safe and to be well uh, and to be able to contribute in a meaningful way without labelling them in a way that can do harm. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to chime in there. I've, I've done not only research on burnout, but I've actually done research on where I, in a survey I have the 23-item burnout assessment tool, the BAT, and then right at the end of the survey, after some other questions, I say, hey, this is a definition of burnout. Does this, this is definitely me. Oh, I think this could be me. No, I don't think this is me. It's absolutely not me. And I found about a third of the New Zealand workforce were really good at assessing whether they were burnt out or not, including somebody who clearly had all of the markers of being burnt out and was saying, no, I am perfectly normal and I'm okay. Because one of the dimensions of burnout includes cognitive impairment. So I like reminding people that you're probably not a very good indicator of being burnt out. And I and I do say to people, you know, fatigue is not burnout. And that's fabulous because you can go on holiday for a week and recover from fatigue or, or make a big step towards recovery. Burnout, I say to people, you know, you're looking at two to three months and nobody wants to waste two to three months in bed, right, going, oh, my gosh, I'm just, I'm shattered. Um, so I always like to remind people, you're not very good, at, in general, we're not very good at determining it and being able to recover because, man, I am, I'm exhausted, I'm fatigued. Okay, use that as, as a reason, and we talked about it in that question there, I can't come to your meeting, I am in a process of protecting myself because I've been doing way too many of these things in the last month, uh, and I'm having to decline most meetings, just letting you know for the month, oh, because now you're inviting somebody to push back at you. And I think they'll say, oh, okay, sorry about that. You know, maybe discuss that with your manager or leader first. But um, especially if you are fatigued, gosh, some academics I know, you know, were so exhausted, especially, you know, late 2020. I was just thinking, man, we got to, you know, and of course, universities in New Zealand, at least, were like, you know, oh, we really care about you, but we don't want to spend any any resources on you because we don't have any money or we're struggling. Um, and I think, we, you know, we do have to remember to be our best, our best protectors, right, because we'll be the best ones to, to look after ourselves because sometimes I think we rely on universities or other employers and they're nowhere near as good as they might write. So, you know, and I like to say that in New Zealand, I say probably 20% of employers are really good. I, and I said this once and I had 150 HR managers nodding their head and I called them out and I said, there's no way all of you are in that top 20%. And then they were all a bit, they were all a bit shitty at me. And I was just like, it's just reality. But, you know, the best do a good job. Most are not the best, unfortunately. Kia ora. Thank you so much. Um, so a huge thank you to our panel. Um, I'm going to hand to Sophie now 
and she can introduce the next part of our presentation. Thank you. Uh, kia ora. Thank you, Elka, Kim, Jared, Lisa. Um, that was gave us a lot to think about. And so what we're going to do for the next 25 minutes is actually have an opportunity to connect with each other in smaller groups and actually talk about some of those things that were raised firstly by Leah and then by the panel. And um, really the aim here, like we would really like people to come away with some kind of action, whether it's at an organizational level or at a personal level. So we're gonna put you in small groups. We are gonna ask you first, of, of course, to introduce yourselves. You're gonna be in the group for about 25 minutes then discuss, okay, what is one action that I could take back to, uh, to my desk, to my organization? And then also, what or who do I need to actually support me to, to uh, work on, on that action? After 25 minutes, we'll bring you back into the group and we'll have a little bit of a report back in terms of uh, responses, ideas, etc. And with, there's certainly plenty to build on in terms of um, the action points that uh, Leah talked about originally in terms of reducing fear of AI, reducing the mental load of the workforce. And you know what organizationally universities might need to do. And then of course, all of the, the tips that the panel came up with too. Kira, well, welcome back. I hope you had some great conversations. Um, now I'm just going to invite people from different groups maybe to unmute and give us an idea of uh, the conversation or some action that they're planning to take back to their organization. So maybe if you just unmute and hop in or else I'll start asking people. Uh, Louise, uh, Sophie, thank you. Hi. Um, and firstly, I would like to thank uh, ATM for this session. It's been absolutely amazing. And the um, panel, etc., cetera, um, gave us great um, uh, things to talk about. And, and our group, um, you know, was, was really around the, the leadership of a transition to, to the use of GAI and what that looks like, um, you know, how we recognise those opportunities. But it was also that, you know, we've got multiple industries in higher education. So there's so many, you know, areas that, you know, um, does everything go GAI? If we're talking about our facilities, management, our, yeah, you know, all of all of our teaching and learning, our administration, our food and beverage, you know, we've got multiple industries. So what does that look like? Um, and who leads that? Is that an HR uh, role or is it a, a bigger, you know, transformation role, um, um, separate sort of team, because I think adding all of that to a current team, um, their, their mental load would be exploded um, in terms of that. So we talked um, uh, quite a bit about that and, and the, the upskilling that would be required and the training and the involvement of, of staff in, in that transition as well. So um, lots to think about, lots to, to talk about. Um, and, um, and really about resilience as well. So we talked about how we can <clears throat> build resilience um, and, and fill our bucket um, so that we, we've got things to dip into to, to use. So yeah, that was our, our group. Thank you, thank you, Louise. Uh, anybody else? I'm happy to go. <laughs> Um, like we had some uh, good conversation in our group, um, focusing on you know what actions we will take back, um, and we talked about you know the blocking out the calendar, you know two hours a day or so. Um, we talked a lot about needing to stop, um, you know, like thinking that we can send emails whenever we want, um, just because of the flexible work, and that um, we should really take responsibility for you know our, our actions on others by. Um, not just firing off emails at all hours of the day and night. Um, so we should use that delay, um, maintaining our boundaries, um, making time for our, you know, retraining and looking for opportunities for that. Um, we also talked about sort of outsourcing some of the things that we're doing. Um, 
like can others can someone else do that and why are we you know still doing some of those activities when someone else could have could have done it um yeah we talked about the short meetings um and we talked a bit about workload as well and we sort of ended up talking about mental load and how um probably this sort of phenomenon in society hasn't like the policies and procedures around it haven't caught up in workplaces so you know you're still expected to be in the workplace and you know have let all of that mental load go and not be a daughter and a mother and you know wife or all these other roles so just that um how that will play out in organizations supporting people around that will be interesting um and probably still a lot more work to do in that area thank you charlotte R obviously rich conversations and yeah I, that balance between okay what's the organizational responsibility here what needs to change at an organizational level and how much actually we take on as individuals is is a big thing anybody else like to uh, contribute to the conversation i'll i'll um, say from our group we had a um really broad ranging discussion um and which I think boils down to we're not our roles for our own mental health. We we do also need to separate ourselves from our roles, uh, from what people might think of us, what people might put on to us versus how we value ourselves uh, for our own mental health. And that therefore there's so many things that came up today. And, you know, we spoke about some of the things that came up in the presentation versus the panel and, and the different things that worked for different people or spoke to different people in the group and that there's more than one thing we can try and and that we can keep persisting with some of these things because it's it's a change um and the most important thing I think that came out from from one of our members was to always then have something to look forward to so whatever that might be will also help with the um the kind of mental load yeah, I like that. Always needing something to look forward to. So it might be karaoke in the car going home, yes. <laughs> or maybe not. If you're not driving to work, maybe just karaoke <laughs> in the house. That's great. Thank you, Kelly. Anybody else? I'm going to... What about you, Donna? What came through in your group? It's not you you're going to choose me, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, um, we had a really interesting discussion. Um, we started off um, talking about, you know, sort of um, managing time and make, you know, maybe having 45, 50 minute um, meetings um, and covered a lot of ground there. We talked about no meeting Fridays or no contact Fridays and how when the senior management didn't observe those that it sent the wrong messages to the rest of us about, you know, sort of we're not supposed to be doing these things, but the senior managers are doing them. So it's OK to schedule meetings on Fridays or send emails on Fridays. And then we moved on to talk about generative AI and yeah, there are challenges there, but there's also an exciting future there. Um, but again, for the universities, finding time for staff to really get their heads around this and how we're actually going to utilise that as a tool is something that I think nobody's really worked out yet. And the speed of the technological change is so rapid. I think that sums it up in a nutshell. Yeah, finding time, especially now when actually the reality for a lot of us in universities is massive organisational change and a lot of people worried about losing their jobs and maybe ending up doing more work not less work yeah challenging thank you uh donna what anyone else like to feedback from their group tony what about you well, Louise covered a lot of what we were talking about in our group. Uh, I just think it's personal observation and just listening to other people uh, just now. Um, I think one of the things I've come away with is just the need um, for us all to have uh, 
conversations in our workplaces about what's going on. And that requires for each of us, including and particularly for leaders, to be, um, I guess, uh, reasonably brave, uh, but also to open the conversations up, but to be able to, um, uh, yeah, just to be willing to share that whole thing about the emotional and cognitive sort of load, um, those aspects was, was uh, something that we've, uh, I think more conversations need to be held. Yeah, there's, a, there's that challenge, isn't there, between um, the importance of connecting as people, the importance of leadership, while at the same time having to actually take on more technical skills in terms of AI, et cetera, is, is a bit of a balance that I can see is a bit challenging. Actually, that's what's coming up for me. Anybody else? I was just going to jump back in actually because um, Louise has just posted something in the chat there and it's really basically to thank A Tim and the panel for creating this opportunity for us to get together and for us to actually be able to kick these ideas around because you know, here we are in a meeting um, but it's given us time and space to think about it and hopefully some of us can go away and make some real changes in our lives put some boundaries in place maybe avoid burnout so yeah thank you A Tim. yeah thank you Donna and I, and I think the other thing as well is, um, you know, what support do people need once they get back to their office to actually follow up on some of these things? Because often we go back and, well, you know, we're straight back into it and there's 100 emails. And I wonder if anybody came up with anything in that area. What help do they need and who's going to give them that help? I might jump in actually to start to answer that question, but then I'd love to hear what other people have to say. Um, I'm Lydia Lorienti. I, I work in a professional role at Monash University. My challenge is that I'm so on board with all of this, but I'm actually the most junior person in the team I'm in and I have no direct. So my biggest challenge for this will be how to implement it because I don't have the role power to implement it. So I really need to be relying on my soft skills, my people and communication and influencing skills. So my challenge is um, how to respectfully but effectively try and influence my peers and the people above me. Um, and maybe it's just a case of modeling it and doing what I'm doing and try to communicate what I'm doing. But that's going to be the biggest challenge where I'm really keen to implement something. But it's a different way to implement if you haven't got um, a team to sort of filter it down to. So, uh, yeah, that was sort of my reflections. <laughs> Good point, Lydia. Has anybody got any, any ideas that would uh, help Lydia on her uh, journey to influence her teams and her manager? I'll jump in there and say that I don't think you have to be a uh, manager to influence the behaviour of people around you or teach some really good skills. And I've learned some amazing things from people that have been in my teams over the years. You watch how people manage things or how they put a boundary in place or just different things they do and think, gee, I could try that. So please don't ever underestimate that no matter where you are in an organisation, you can have a lot more influence than you realise. So I should have put my hand up. Sorry, I jumped in because I was so passionate about wanting you to know <laughs> it's not about your level. It's about the influence and how you can demonstrate some of these things to people. Great. Thank you, Kim. Tony, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, look, I thought that was a great point, uh, Lydia, and you nailed some of the ways that you could do it. The other thing is I think that um, the slides and what have you will become available to us afterwards and just sharing and starting the conversation from today's discussion is probably a really sort of soft power way to start those conversations and perhaps, uh, you know, starting small and local and then um, see where that goes. But, uh, you know, it's that um, from little things, big things grow, as Paul Kelly once saying. Thanks. Uh, Francesca. Um, as someone who's not a natural diplomat, I feel like um, it would be great to learn, you know, I've got a whole bunch of skills, but diplomacy perhaps isn't one of them. And I'm more likely to blurt something out and then wonder why people aren't on board. So learning those um, 
influence and negotiation skills. That that's the thing that not everybody has. Uh, so you you know you don't have it, you can't deploy it. But that that's something that, from my perspective, I think that's the you, you need the skill to influence your workplace without just blurting things out. Thanks, Francesca. And the first step towards that, of course, is being aware that you do tend to blurt things out. So you're on the right path. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Just we're about time to round up. But if anybody's got any last thoughts, please. Can I say something, Sophie? Yep, who, I can't see who's, oh, ML, yes, yeah, sorry. It's ML, your boss, hello. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think it's really important that when you see people doing these things that you actually give them little bits of praise and feedback to say, hey, I see that, you you know, you've turned your, you know, you're out of offices on or whatever it is, that you actually say, I see you and I think you're doing something awesome because that's infectious. Sorry, that's enough. Yeah. You don't have to apologise. That's great. Thanks, ML. Just all of these screens, it's difficult to work out who's where they where the voices are coming from. So when you go back, then definitely praising your colleagues when you notice that they are actually looking after themselves. Um, yeah, good point. Catherine. Um, if I could just follow up on that comment, Sophie, um, as as a um, I discussed this in my in my group, but as a um, a leader of quite a large team and a lot of women, one of the challenges is that I've got people who are quite open about what their needs are, and I can accommodate them. But I also have people who are reluctant to tell me what their needs are um, because of fear of reprisal or not feeling safe or all sorts of reasons and. Um, and one of the challenges that I'm trying to get past is, is how do I um, facilitate those people feeling more comfortable about coming forward and, and um, you know, making it, it feel safe enough for them to feel that they can actually tell me what their needs are. Yeah, good point, Catherine. <clears throat> Creating that space where people feel safe to come to their manager and share their challenges. Anybody got any um, suggestions or advice around that? Um, hi, it's Kelly here again. Um, one of the things that I've found in terms of helping to create a safe space is sharing something of mine, like showing my own vulnerability as a manager. Um, you know, we kind of, sorry, I've got a, I've got a cat here right in front of me, so you're going to get the backside. Um, and I also had worked with people and work with people now who do the same thing. And it it's amazing that, I, I can't remember who said it before, whether it was Tony, it's that kind of flow on effect of, or, you know, it, you open the door to things um, when you step through first. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Kelly, yep. Yeah. Um, sharing your own vulnerabilities with your team so that they feel safer to share theirs. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, well, it's, it's a great uh, conversation and lots of wonderful ideas. Um, and it's coming up to uh, 4.15. Doesn't time fly when uh, you're having <laughs> great conversations? So what I am going to do now is... Um, I'm going to hand over to Louise, uh, Louise Batchelor. So um, Louise is the registrar from Bond University. She is also uh, a longtime ATEM member and she's a board director and she is also the chair of the Queensland Regional ATEM Committee. And I'm just going to ask Louise to give us a bit of a, a wrap up and reflections on the session today. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Um, what a, a great session. I think it's very timely. I've written myself lots of notes. I was just taking down lots of nuggets of information that, that came 
um, from the various um, um, speakers. And, and if, if we don't address this now, um, I think it's going to um, catch us. I think, you know, we're seeing um, um, staff return, um, you know, post-COVID, if I say that five, you know, um, letter word that we had to live with, with for three years. Um, and, you know, we've seen the, uh, the, the great resignation. We've seen lots, you know, it's really hard to get staff. If you're recruiting for staff, it's quite hard to get staff um, with the skills that you need. But it's also now the future skills that we're going to need for, for, for staff. So there was lots of, you know, um, nuggets of information about, you know, what we should be doing, what we should be thinking about. But it's also about, you know, our, self, our own self-care. Uh, if, we, if we can't lead ourselves, we can't lead others. So it's really about, from my perspective, is um, um, making sure that your behaviour um, is, is um, something that, that people um, um, can relate to in terms of their own situation. Um, you know, burnout is the worst um, um, thing and been there, done that, and, and I don't ever want to go back there again. So I'm really, really conscious of making sure, um, particularly around, you know, setting boundaries for people, you know, around their, you know, if you're sick, I'll work from home. Now, if you're sick, you're not working from home, you know. So, so really thinking about, you know, how you lead um, that messaging um, and you have to actually walk the talk. Um, so, you know, if you're not feeling well, then, you know, I'm not going to be in today and I'm not going to be contactable, um, you know, in terms of, you know, being available. So it's setting those boundaries. Um, you know, the burnout is real. Um, we've got to fill our resilience bucket so that we've, we've got um, 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 something to dip into. And, and what this future of work looks like in terms of GAI, I think we can gain some massive efficiencies um, in adopting it uh, um, appropriately. And, and I'm not sure who's going to, to, to lead that from an institution point of view, um, because we've, we've got, like I said in my other little bit, was we've got lots of industries in, in higher uh, education institutions. Um, and, and what that looks like. So I think from our perspective, in our respective roles, we should be thinking about where that could possibly benefit um, the staff um, to reduce the mental load, to reduce the workload, to, to be able to give space to creativity. Um, and, and if we are expecting that job growth of you know, 1.5 million in HE, um, we're going to have to have a plan for training, et cetera, and so forth to attract people into the industry. It's hard at the moment um, in attracting staff. Um, and, um, yeah, I think, you know, the speakers have, have, have touched on um, a lot of what we, we need to do and some good practices, um, um, you know, to do that. Uh, but I think it's going to be a big piece of work and... Um, and when it happens, I'm not sure um, because, you know, we've gone from a, a, to a digital transformation in a sense that everybody's doing everything digitally, you know, in terms of communications, et cetera. Um, but what does it look like um, uh, from the perspective of using AI to do some of our work, to free us up to do more meaningful work and connections with, with our own colleagues and with students? Thank you, Louise. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot to think about, isn't there? Uh, it's a definitely a balancing act, but I suppose the positive is that actually AI should mean that there will be more time for us to actually look after ourselves. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and I am now going to hand over to ML and ask her to close the session for us. And um, while ML is talking, I'm, well, I, or if I can navigate the technology, we will also release a poll to get a bit of a feedback on today's session. So 
thank you all for contributing and ML. Thank you. I am conscious I'm standing between you and some burgled time, to quote Jared. So I'm going to do my very best to be quick here. First of all, I just want to say a big thank you to all of the A team team who have put this together. Sophie, who's been the curator today, um, Catherine, Elka, and Louise, who have contributed to the vibrancy and the different um, the depth of the discussions. I really do want to thank Leah, Jared, Kim, and Lisa um, for the keynote, the panel. Um, I came today, I was a bit low on energy, but I am so re-energised about hearing about the different things that we can do, hearing about the amazing research that is being done in our institutions that will change the future of work. That's really important. And there was things that we can do and there's big things that we still need to tackle. But I want to say thank you so much for sharing your time, your expertise, your knowledge and your energy and enthusiasm. It's lovely to hear people talking about um, research in um, terms that we can understand and relate to really quickly and easily. Um, just two things. Oh, and I, a big shout out to Leah, who's behind the scenes. We've got two Leahs today um, who's producing this as well. Makes this all seamless. Um, where next? I love when I hear people say, thanks to ATEM, I love this. We're always thinking about what next, what can we do better, bigger, etc. So if you've got some ideas, please reach out to myself and the team and let us know. This is our second um, Women in Higher Education Leadership Symposium. We would like to make it an annual tradition. So um, let us, you know, any thoughts about how we can build this bigger and better and, and spread the word would be, we'd love um, to hear from you. And um, today's a big letter day. It's not only the day we've held the symposium, but we've just launched our new conference, um, ATEM. Um, we have previously with partners run a conference called TEMC this year um, and in the future years we're running our own flagship conference. It launched today. You'll see it on socials. It might be in your inbox. Um, it's called ATEM 23. It's the name of the conference, but the theme is Brave. And it's all about how can individuals, teams, organisations and systems be brave about creating a future for higher education as well. So I hope you might join us. Melbourne, 11th to 13th of October. Jared, see, you're going to Boston, but, you know, Melbourne awaits. Um, but hopefully we will see you at either um, um, ATEM 23 or at another ATEM event soon. Thank you for gifting us your time, knowledge and expertise. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well done, everybody. Thank you.